Around the world, inflation rates are skyrocketing, often reaching two digits. In the US, inflation is the highest in 40 years, while corporate profits are the highest since 72 years. People around the world have risen up to protest the price increases, calls for strikes intensify, the government in the UK has collapsed, and we've seen a new rise of fascism in Italy, partly explained by the economic crisis. Politicians are hailing a slight reduction of inflation in some places this year as some sort of great success, but record price increases are projected to remain with us for at least several years and are ranked as the most severe global risk within the next two years by the World Economic Forum. US politicians like to focus on higher gas prices, which undoubtedly intensify inflation, but they conveniently tend to not talk about rents, for instance, which is far more devastating for lots of people, and which is soaring in many cities, intensifying evictions. But it is pretty much everything that has gotten more expensive, from chips costing £8 in the UK, to even Swedish giant IKEA becoming a low-quality luxury furniture chain. This morning show has offered to pay energy bills as a competition price. We are officially in the dystopian black mirror phase of capitalism. It is going to be... It's your energy bill! Oh my god, thank we're, you. We're paying your energy bill for four months. Real wages have been crashing everywhere. US consumer prices have risen 15% since the start of the pandemic, while average weekly earnings have gone up by only 7.8%. Real wages represent what you can actually buy with them. The nominal wage is the literal amount of money you get paid. So if you receive $3,000 a month, and if your rent goes from $1,000 to $2,000, your nominal wage remains the same, but your real wage has decreased by a lot. This has devastating consequences. Inflation often means hunger and death for the hundreds of millions of poor people living in low-income countries. What is inflation? Former content producer for Vox and now prominent YouTuber with over 3 million subscribers Johnny Harris puts forth this definition. Inflation is when there is more money in the economy than stuff to spend it on. You've likely heard of this explanation because it's everywhere. In fact, the original meaning of the term was an increase of the amount of money, not price. The theory goes, as you have more money in the system, but not more stuff, more money chases fewer goods and services and thus prices increase. This is called the monetarist theory of inflation. Joe Biden recently stated, inflation is the Fed's job. However, in recent years, even mainstream economics has more or less abandoned this idea that there is a linear relation between money and inflation. The standard definition now is that inflation is simply the rise of prices over an extended period of time. Even one standard economics textbook states, quote, the rationale was simple. A low target rate of money growth implied a low average rate of inflation. That strategy did not work well. Starting in the early 1990s, a dramatic rethinking of monetary policy took place. Inflation rates did not significantly increase when central banks put trillions of dollars into the banking system to prevent a meltdown during the COVID pandemic or during the financial crisis of 2007-2008. All the money credit from the so-called quantitative easing measures just went mostly into hoarding, stocks or property. There, inflation happened in share prices and the wealth of billionaires, but not grocery prices. The European Central Bank has engaged in quantitative easing for almost a decade without causing corresponding inflation. The truth is that mainstream economics doesn't really understand what causes inflation very well. As investment banker and current leader of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, put it, we understand better now how little we understand about inflation. Former European Central Bank Vice President admitted, quote, Economics is indeed struggling with inflation theory. Money aggregates and monetarism have been correctly abandoned. 
Former leader of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, said, quote, Our framework for understanding inflation dynamics could be misspecified in some fundamental way. These are surprisingly open admissions by mainstream analysis. Various things have been made responsible for this disaster. The central bank, the financial sector, misguided fiscal or monetary policy, the Biden administration, the Trump administration. Many mainstream economists and so-called market experts have a better explanation. The real reason, they say, is you. Leading mainstream economist and Harvard professor Jason Furman said, quote, When wages go up, that leads prices to go up. This follows from basic micro and common sense. Associate professor of economics Joe Mitchell aptly says that whatever proceeds this is just micro and common sense is likely nonsense. Former Treasury Secretary and Epstein flight log entry Larry Summers openly said that, quote, wage inflation will have to come down significantly and that a meaningful recession is necessary. We will analyze the claim that high wages are at fault later in this video. The real underlying reason for inflation is none of the things I have mentioned so far. Who is hurt most by the increase in prices? Naturally, the poorer you are, the larger the proportion of your income that goes to necessities. Nearly all of the expenses go to food, housing or energy. If half of your income goes to food, an increase in food prices can mean hunger or death, as is the case with much of the people living in low-income countries. Households with greater disposable incomes can more easily withstand those increases. They are also more likely to have investments, mortgages and greater retirement savings. They are often themselves landlords, which means they receive more money if rents go up. They have larger savings while much of the working class doesn't. Working class people have to forgo spending their money on stuff that isn't a necessity. And who is benefiting from the current inflation? Well, don't you already know? Inflation is often portrayed as a neutral economic reality, objective and universal, as an apolitical concept arising out of the seemingly natural forces of supply and demand. But in truth, underlying it is blood, politics, exploitation and the quest for wealth and power. Inflation is often depicted as a beast that must be tamed. Of course, explaining inflation in this way serves a purpose. Naturalizing economic phenomena, making them a force of nature, and the result of quote, rational choices, serves to entrench the dominant ideology and to hide its class interests. There's an underrated passage by Karl Marx in The Poverty of Philosophy. Quote, Economists have a singular method of procedure. There are only two kinds of institutions for them, artificial and natural. The institutions of feudalism are artificial institutions. Those of the bourgeoisie are natural institutions. The relations of bourgeois production, therefore, are themselves natural laws, independent of the influence of time. They are eternal laws which must always govern society. Thus, there has been history, but there is no longer any. Because once we start seeing economics for what it is, as fundamentally political and ideological, and start seeing capitalism as a very specific social system in human history, driven by class contradictions, something dangerous can happen. Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England, summarized the analysis of the mainstream when he said in February, quote, I'm not saying nobody gets a pay rise, don't get me wrong, but what I'm saying is we do need to see restraint in pay bargaining, otherwise it will get out of control. The idea is that wages are to be blamed for rising prices and that the solution is to keep them down. This explanation has a name. It's called the wage-price spiral, 
As workers struggle for higher wages, it'll put pressure on the company to raise prices to keep profitability up and the business going. In turn, workers seek even higher wages, again reinforcing inflation. Keynesian guru Martin Wolf of the Financial Times explained, quote, What central bankers have to do is prevent a wage-price spiral. In other words, wages must be kept from going up, while unemployment must rise. The other prominent Keynesian, Paul Krugman, advocated in the New York Times to increase unemployment to control inflation. The story goes that people got too much money from the COVID relief packages. And along with increasing wages, people could now buy too much stuff, which forced businesses to raise prices. Johnny Harris in his video with over 1.2 million views says, But even people who didn't lose a job got a check in the mail. It was free money for everyone. And we spent it. We all just got these big checks from the government. During a pandemic, we're like, YOLO, I'm buying a boat or a Peloton or whatever. He portrays the current situation as simply So what do businesses do with all this insane new demand? They raise prices all at the same time. And that is inflation. <sighs> I feel like we're getting this at this point. Yet again, naturalizing inflation, diluting the class character of the economy, and the nature of business to exploit any situation to hike prices at the cost of the average worker. What central bankers are proposing is to increase the interest rate. The higher the interest rate, the lower the readiness of companies and households to invest or consume due to the higher cost of borrowing. Additionally, those who abstain from spending receive higher rewards, or so the theory says. The goal is to reduce the bargaining power of workers and to create unemployment to reduce the demand which is supposedly driving inflation. In reality, it is to save profits. Johnny Harris, who studied economics himself, parrots the hawkish central bankers by praising the hiking of interest rates as a means to combat inflation without critically reflecting on whether or not this is actually something that works this time. He claims that the central bank's goal is not to make a profit. And the central bank isn't motivated by profit, but rather their job is to babysit the economy. Completely distracting from the class character of bourgeois state institutions who all aim to facilitate profit maximization, saying that the Fed is here to stabilize the economy. That it totally works. We're like freaking puppets. Despite its horrible track record to keep things stable. So, is there something to this? Bourgeois economists have always had various explanations to why an increase in wages leads to various problems or why they can't rise above a certain threshold. Already in the early 19th century, English economist Thomas Malthus posed that if wages rose above a subsistence minimum, workers would be able to have more children, and as the population would increase, it raises the supply of labor, which would force wages back to their subsistence minimum. A little later, neo-Ricardian trade unionist Thomas Weston argued within the circles of the First International that if wages were to increase, employers would just hike prices making the whole thing futile. According to Weston, there is an iron law of wages, which, similar to Ricardo and Adam Smith's natural price of labor, cannot be broken. Karl Marx responded to this in various speeches published in the pamphlet Value, Price and Profit. He argued that there is some truth to this, but the relation of the workers who produce the commodities and the owners of the means of production is not fixed, but based on the class struggle. Capitalists cannot raise or lower wages merely at their whim, nor can they raise prices at will in order to make up for lost profits resulting from an increase in wages. After all, there is a reason employers dedicate a substantial amount of resources to prevent worker organizing and break strikes. If they could raise wages at their whim, they wouldn't need to worry about wage increases. The wage push explanation of inflation has been rebutted both on a theoretical and empirical level. The Bank of International Settlements, BIS, located in the Swiss city of Basel, also called the Central Bank of Central Banks, recently conducted a study corroborating that, quote, by some measures, the current environment does not look conducive to such a spiral. Making wages responsible for the current inflation is especially silly, 
considering that wages are not keeping up with inflation. Real wages have been falling radically. The labor share of income has also declined, especially after the Covid slump. This is the total opposite of the theory of the iron law of wages and the Keynesian explanations. A recent report by the BIS also shows how collective bargaining power of workers and trade union membership have been falling. It is something else that has radically gone up. Profits. Corporate profit margins are at their highest since 1950. The BIS study explains, quote, Firms' pricing power, as measured by the markup of prices over costs, has increased to historical highs. You always hear about the wage price spiral, but you never hear about the profit price spiral, do you? An analysis of the Securities and Exchange Commission filings found that net profits increased by a median of 49% in the last two years, in one instance even by a whopping 111,000%. Corporations are using increasing costs as an excuse to increase their prices higher than they need to do to keep their profit rate constant or to increase it. Corporate executives know about their ability to exploit inflation in order to raise prices. And they say it. Michelle Buck, the CEO of Hershey Bar, told investors, quote, Pricing will be an important lever for us this year and is expected to drive most of our growth. A Kroger executive told investors, A little bit of inflation is always good for our business. And the hostess CEO earlier this year said, Rising prices across the economy helps profits. CEO of US-based Iron Mountain says that he prayed inflation would come so he could raise prices. Once again, it's the workers having to pay for the problems of capitalism. Bigger, more concentrated companies tend to have greater pricing power, that is, the ability to increase prices without losing customers to competitors. Apple, for instance, has great pricing power because it is one of the few players in the market for smartphones and mobile app infrastructure. In the US, for instance, most industries have become much more concentrated compared to the 80s. Four companies control almost 90% of meat and poultry processing, two corporations control most of the consumer staples market, and one company can set the price for much of seed corn in the US. Hence, grocery prices are exploding, not just because some of their inputs are getting more expensive. These companies can set higher prices because they can. Marx said in his debate with Weston, quote, A general rise in the rate of wages will result in a fall of the general rate of profit, but not affect the prices of commodities. That is what really worries central bankers, a fall in profitability. But the rise of costs are also often the result of big capital to exploit the situation. A look at those costs reveals a deeper story. Energy retail companies in the UK are restricted by energy regulator Ofgem to a 2% profit rate on total costs. But included in these costs are the prices of suppliers, which provide services and material to retailers. Those suppliers are mostly the Big Six, as they are called in the UK. The Big Six can charge up to 40% of the profit rate within their prices, hence ultimately making up to 10% of the price to the end consumer. These companies in turn are owned by large private equity companies and hedge funds, who also rake in their share of profits. But the largest cut goes to the big energy giants, Shell, Exxon, BP and so on. Here's where the big money is. These corporations made a total of almost $100 billion in the first half of last year. Public ownership of the energy grid can somewhat counter these tendencies, such as in Germany or in Denmark. But ultimately, big oil runs the show. The rules of capitalism determine the rules of the capitalist state. Petroleum corporations have stated that they're intentionally keeping production low and prices high to make up for their shareholders losing so much money in the past few years. Does this mean that companies can engage in so-called price gouging at whim? Giant corporations are ultimately subject to the laws of the market and competition as well, 
If they could arbitrarily raise prices to whatever level they want, they would constantly do so at whim in order to increase their profits indefinitely and prevent crisis of profitability. Apple can charge high prices without losing significant market share to Samsung, for instance. But even Apple has to be aware of how far it can do so. If prices cross a certain limit, too many will switch to Android phone providers, for instance. Capitalists need people to buy back the product they create. Paying workers as little as possible and charging them as much as possible is one of the chief contradictions within capitalism. The BIS sums up, quote, In product markets, the degree of competition comes into play. Utilizing price increases whenever possible, that's what being company partners who advise corporations argue as well. Quote, Pricing moves, executed thoughtfully and strategically, can not only help cover cost increases, but also expand margins. This is polished business consultant speak for times are rough, Screw your customers while the screwing is good. And this is not surprising. This is what capitalism is all about. If the rising inflation is really due to weak supply as opposed to strong demand, it will mean that this new shock therapy, increasing the interest rate and quantitative tightening, won't decrease inflation without risking to push the US economy into a new slump. Many warn that this could trigger a new, Volcker moment. Paul Volcker was the chief of the Fed in the 70s and jacked up interest rates to double digits in order to combat inflation, which led to a deep, painful recession in the beginning of the 80s, devastating the working class around the world, leading to an 11% unemployment rate in the US in 1982 and to external debt crises in Latin American and African countries, which was considered a quote, lost decade for their so-called economic development. Yet, most macroeconomists agree with Larry Summers and have called Volcker's policy a, quote, success story, further showing the detachment of these guys from reality and the needs of most people on Earth. Goldman Sachs president John Waldron said, quote, we might need to bring back Paul Volcker. Measures to control energy prices are out of the question for many so-called serious macroeconomists who ridicule anyone even suggesting these. A recent Fed paper admitted that Volcker shock has been vastly overplayed and that inflation was solved through class war and the degradation of the union movement as opposed to monetary policy. Though these two things are obviously entwined, it's the causing of the recession that further crushed labor organization an intentional outcome by the lackeys of capital. According to the Wall Street Journal, almost 60% of economists say that the Fed will hike interest rates too much, causing unnecessary weakness in the economy, up from 45% in last July. A recent survey found that 98% of CEOs stated that they're preparing for a U.S. recession. Of course, wage increases have often preceded inflation in the past. But this is simply due to the fact that capitalists control the levers of economic power. A strengthening of worker organization leads to the intensifying of exploitation to restore former profit rates. Blaming wages for inflation in this sense is just like blaming Palestinian liberation fighters for the increased repression by the Israeli apartheid regime. These explanations are the natural result of eliminating class struggle and exploitation from the equations of dominant mainstream economics theory. Blaming workers is nothing more than class war propaganda. Inflation is just another flashpoint of class struggle. Karl Marx has acknowledged that in the long term, workers' associations by themselves ultimately cannot withstand the laws of competition. He nonetheless welcomes their struggle and organization as training grounds for the eventual abolition of the bourgeois order. Economic processes are complex. It's easy for the bourgeois propagandists to twist cause and effect. It usually is the working class who has to defend wage rates in reaction to increased capitalist suppression. As Marx explained, workers have to do this in order to not lag behind across the economic cycle.
As the 10-hour act showed, higher wages do not always prevent capitalists from receiving higher profits, whereas the reverse is almost always true. Inflation is an easy way for the capitalist class to increase profits. Keynes himself suggested how inflation is easier than cutting wages directly in order to raise profit levels. It's profits, not wages, that need to be controlled, says Robert Reich in The Guardian. But the capitalist state won't control profits to any significant degree, because profits are its lifeblood. They can't be kept in check by a state that is pro-profit. The whole profit system needs to be abolished if we want to solve the problems of capitalism. Interest rates have been hiked seven times to 4.5% last year in a speedy way, with more increases to come, risking devastating shocks. Only now is inflation starting to cool down a little bit. But this isn't because they directly target the renormalizing of inflation. It's to crush aggregate demand and undermine what they see as a favorable labor market for workers. They are a blunt intervention. They don't target industry-specific prices like energy, for instance. They also increase the cost of borrowing and will force millions already in debt into poverty. Quote, High inflation is not workers' fault, but the Fed is waging a war on US workers. Raising interest rates won't do much anyway because it's not excess demand that is at fault, but the other side of the equation, supply, which is broken. As the governor of the Bank of England said, quote, monetary policy will not increase the supply of semiconductor chips. It will not increase the amount of wind, no, really. And nor will it produce more HGV drivers. Supply is insufficient, especially in energy and food production, where it matters for many people. But why? Lockdowns, loss of staff and various other COVID-related disruptions of global commodity chains caused various shortages of important materials and components, leading to higher prices for these inputs. Not thoroughly dealing with the pandemic and focusing on economic growth and profitability could mean more supply chain disruptions in the future. Global supply chains rely on a worldwide network of transportation services, predominantly container shipping, which are highly sensitive to disruptions. The chains are geared toward maximum exploitation of the global workforce, not toward stability or sustainability. Complex food systems geared toward profit, rely on food import dependency of low-income countries and are sensitive to price changes. Russia and Ukraine are two leading grain exporters. The region exports over a third of the world's wheat. The region is known as the breadbasket of Europe. The Global Food Price Index was at its highest ever recorded. Countries who import a lot of wheat are hurt especially, such as countries in the Middle East or Northern Africa, like Egypt. Prices of these imports are determined by international commodity exchanges in Chicago or London. Many experts estimate that food speculation is responsible for up to 25% of current price increases. Last year, bets on price increases for grains and oil seeds hit highs not seen since 2012. About 350 million people are now likely in acute food insecurity. That's more than 200 million than before the pandemic. Just four giants, known as ABCD, dominate more than 70% of global grain trade. Cargill, which is the largest privately held corporation in the United States in terms of revenue, reported a massive 23% revenue increase to a record $165 billion last year, while Archer Daniels Midland hit the highest profit records ever. Conglomerates dominating the consumer processed food sector with massive control over their supply chains, such as Procter & Gamble, Nestle or Spanish-French Danone have used the pandemic as an excuse to increase prices simultaneously. Along with greater tension in imperialist contradictions goes the rise of arms sales and the boom in the global arms industry. The arms industry is non-productive. Weapons do not add to consumption. This is inflationary. Inflation and weapon sales go hand in hand. During the Vietnam War, the price level in the US doubled. But the truth about the so-called supply chain bottlenecks, so frequently cited by many analysts, is in itself very vacuous. 
It doesn't say very much if it isn't explained where they come from, fundamentally. Car prices in the US hit record highs in last July with a 12% increase year on year. The excuse for this is the worldwide shortage of semiconductors, which today represent much of the value in any automobile. Again, the consumer is being misled. The shortage in chips was short-lived and ended last year. The main problems are overproduction and lower profit margins. Car manufacturers used the pandemic as an excuse to cut wasteful production and thus reduce the demand for simpler microprocessors. Chip production is massively important. We use them everywhere. It is one of the key factors in the increased tension between the US and China. Bourgeois apologists of capitalism like to depict the market as self-regulating and harmonious. Nothing is further from the truth. Capitalism is inherently irregular, uneven and chaotic, marked by violent alternation of boom and slump. Emeritus professor of economics at the University of Cambridge, Robert Rothorn, argues that inflation is closely connected to the process of capital accumulation, that one can have but an incomplete understanding of it without grasping the general theory of accumulation and crises contained in the writings of Marx. The activities of producers are not coordinated by a central plan to fulfill social needs as in socialism, but is chaotically directed by market forces and the profit imperative. Inflation is a device for regulating economic expansion, raising profits at the expense of wages and boost capital accumulation. Crisis in capitalism is not irregular or a result of a miscalculation. It fulfills the essential function of regeneration of profit rates through the destruction of so-called zombie companies, the crushing of working-class resistance and so on. It's a feature, not a bug. That's why as a Marxist you can always be the smart person among your friends by saying that a crisis will arrive soon, because under capitalism it always will. Marxists understand that class struggle is to be seen as the underlying current of all capitalist phenomena, including inflation. This is what is hidden or straight up denied in dominant economic explanations, and for good reasons. Marx said that the science of bourgeois economy reached its limits with Ricardo because, quote, he consciously made the antagonism of class interests, of wages and profits, of profits and rents, the starting point of his investigation. With the so-called marginalist revolution, class and politics were eliminated from the supposedly purely rational, self-contained economic sphere, partly because the labor movement and its assault on bourgeois ideology grew stronger in the 19th century. Johnny Harris in his video on inflation doesn't mention the workers' struggle or record profits of corporations a single time, and uncritically concludes at the end, The Federal Reserve is raising interest rates. The Federal Reserve taking action to try and curb rising inflation. They're gently raising the interest rate to cool down all of this hardcore spending and borrowing. See if they can steer the ship back on course. And let's hope it works. Hope is not what the proletariat can afford. The only way to prevent inflation and crises is to take power away from capitalists, organize production around the needs of humanity and ecology, and to explain to people how the capitalist class and its academic lackeys distract and deceive them from all sides, preventing the proletariat from understanding the underlying causes of their suffering and from its inevitable historic task to bring an end to bourgeois robbery and class warfare.